Hey, Sam, thanks for joining me today, friend. Very happy to be here, Tashin. Thanks for inviting me on the show. You know, we had a, a previous episode scheduled. Some stuff came up with uh, my mom's health and some family things, and we had to push. So thank you for being flexible, rescheduling. Very much looking forward to it. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, yeah, I've been really enjoying uh, following you on Twitter and watching your YouTube videos about, uh, you know, movement and pain and so on. And, uh, you know, part of the reason I was interested is uh, have had some of my own physical health challenges like everyone else. And I've just really mm -hmm. felt empowered by the approach that you take of sort of like, hey, there's stuff you can do about these things. And that's been of interest to me and I imagine to many others. So would really love to just get to know you better and kind of hear where your perspective is coming from and get a background there. And um, yeah, maybe you could start just by sharing your own, you know, who you are and uh, yeah. your background and your life story and how you got here. For sure. So uh, I am Sam Martin, doctor of physical therapy, uh, physical therapist, licensed in three U.S. states, Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan. Um, and yeah, I you know, I do clinical practice in physical therapy. I have basically a, a concierge PT practice in Michigan where I drive to people's homes, bring a table, do my hands-on treatment at their home. Um, and uh, I also, I think what you and, and most people on the internet know me as is I have a Twitter account and a YouTube channel and it's called the Move Better Project. And that is a brand I actually like, thought of many, many years ago in terms of thinking about what I wanted to stand for as at that time I was a strength coach. Um, but what, you know, kind of distilled what's important to me about teaching people how to move and that's quality is more important than quantity. And uh, that's kind of what, that's the biggest message I want to send out of this or anything else I've put out there is like, how you move matters more than how much it's great to move a lot. It's very important to move a lot, but it's also important to be able to move uh, through a full range of motion and with strength through that full range of motion because that makes your life better. You have less pain, you're harder to injure, uh, and just the overall experience of being alive improves it with the more that you can do. Um, in terms of how I got to being on this podcast right now, uh, well, I was born in Lansing, Michigan. I'm currently in a house in East Lansing, Michigan, not too far from there. Um, I went to high school in East, East Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is a town that the American Pie movies are based upon, if that gives you an idea of what it was like. Uh, very lily white suburb, uh, high school sports, very, very important in the culture of East Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I was not very athletic when I was that age. I tried, I played baseball in high school, it was fine. You know, I could hang in there by trying really hard, but not a natural athlete in any way. Uh, much more of sort of a book smart person. And after high school, I went to the University of Chicago, which, uh, you know, some people know what that is, some people don't. It's like a very hard to get into uh, private school for college that, you know, lots of Nobel Prize winners and uh, that kind of thing. It's sort of like Harvard without the uh, branding. Um, but that was an environment where everybody there was not only one of the best students at their high school, but they also cared a lot about school and they loved school and they wanted to work really hard at it. I was somebody who in high school was probably one of the smartest people in high school, but I thought being smart meant that you didn't have to try hard to do well in school. That was to me, the, you know, everybody in my whole life is like, oh my God, you're so smart, you're so smart from young age, test scores, all this crap. And my, the value that I internalized was like, oh, I'm good because I don't have four card. Um, you get to college uh, or I get to college and I was trying to major in physics at the University of Chicago. And that was an environment where you not only had to be smart, you also had to work really hard. And I didn't understand how to do that. So I had a really hard time in undergrad. Didn't do very well. Got out of there somehow with an economics major. My dad is an economics professor at Michigan State. And literally at the end of college, he was doing my homework in my classes to just get me out of there. Uh, but after college, I wanted something very different from that. You know, I kind of failed at the, that track of life, going to an elite college and then launching, you know, a career. Um, I got a degree, but I really had no real prospects in that area or interest in pursuing economics or physics or anything else. So I moved to Los Angeles, California, 
and I tried to do stand up. I had taken a year off when I was in undergrad due to some academic issues and done some stand up around Chicago. Thought, okay, you know what? This is something I can do. I had started a choir in college, sort of a men's glee club, you know, would talk on stage before shows, really like that performing kind of aspect. And so I moved to LA and I did a couple open mic nights, but I pretty quickly pretty quickly realized that that was not it. I didn't have, I think that Seth Rogen tells a story that like, you know, somebody told him they wanted to be a boxer until they sparred against someone who really wanted to be a boxer. And that was me. I wanted to be a stand-up comedian until I did open mic nights with people who really wanted to be stand-up comedians. And um, yeah, so I was kind of out there, uh, wasn't ready to admit defeat and move home. That was unacceptable to me. So I had to kind of find something. I'd gotten into something called CrossFit, which I think a lot of people know what it is now. Back then it was very out there in 2009, not a lot of people doing it, not a lot of gyms, kind of this underground fight club type uh, strength and conditioning movement. And I got an internship at a CrossFit gym in Santa Monica called CrossFit LA. And started off just like cleaning the gym and cleaning the toilets in exchange for a free membership, that kind of thing. And then gradually, you know, kind of work your way in, you make yourself useful. Um, all right. You know, you can teach one class on Sunday mornings. Okay. You can teach a little more. Okay. You're working here full time kind of thing. So I sort of slowly got into teaching people how to move. And what I found out about CrossFit was that I really liked the detail being detail oriented about movement and really understanding at a deeper level how to solve problems that people have. Because when you take just, you know, the selection of people that come into a CrossFit gym and you try to teach them challenging movements, Olympic lifts, gymnastics exercises, going, you know, into handstands, doing muscle ups on the rings, things like that. There are a lot of deficits in terms of strength, range of motion, coordination, ability to execute these very challenging things. And in CrossFit, especially you have to execute challenging things under pressure, uh, everything's done at high intensity. And that's one of the problems with that is it's a little too risky for a lot of the average people. And you see a lot of injuries with it, but still it was this test of like, you have an hour class, you have these very technical movements, you have just sort of people who, you know, were not division one college athletes that you have to teach to do the challenging movements in an hour. So you do that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, you're going to get better. Well, you know, you can do it in a very casual way. And that's kind of the way a lot of people do it is like, you just kind of like write the thing on the whiteboard and you demonstrate the movements and you pass out the barbells and you just kind of turn on the music and let it sort itself out. But I always wanted to be like, okay, how can I actually teach this person to do whatever movement, deadlift, handstand, push up, whatever, or some version of that that's appropriate for them that they can do properly, where they're going to get stronger, faster, whatever, not get injured. So that sort of, you know, experience, all that honed my focus on wanting to teach people how to move better. And I had a certain set of tools as a strength coach to do that. And I was pretty good at it. I was, I felt as good as I was going to get at it and wasn't being challenged anymore to get better. You know, I was kind of hitting coasting in terms of being a strength coach, personal trainer. So I moved back to Chicago. Uh, I had some, just my life was kind of overall stuck after a few years in LA, things had gone well, but I was looking for more. Um, and I moved back to Chicago. I got an internship at Northwestern University, which is a, a college in Evanston, Illinois, that has a division one athletics program. So I was working as an intern in the weight room for these division one athletes. And I thought this will surely be a more intellectual environment where people are really focused on the science and the technique and, and really detail oriented and going to have more developed philosophies on movement and be able to learn and kind of develop myself at a higher level. What I found was that the CrossFit gym was much more of an intellectually challenging environment than the division one weight room. And it was a big disappointment and I didn't know what to do with my life. And I kind of just stalled for, I quit the internship. I was working at another CrossFit gym in Chicago and I just kind of stalled for about a year. Didn't know what to do. Just kind of treading water. Um, I'd met my wife. Uh, we were dating. She had moved in and I was kind of like not the, the forward momentum had kind of stopped. Um, it was like, all right, what am I going to do now? 
And a couple of my students were physical therapists that I taught CrossFit to. And I went to their clinics and just did some observation with them. And I saw, and I'd also gotten hands on treatment before I had a chiropractor in LA, a guy named Manny Maniloff, incredible uh, chiropractor, uh, movement improver. And he had these big, powerful hands and he just could find right where the problem spots were and go after them, fix them. And I could move better afterward. And I saw the same thing with these physical therapists. One was Dr. Katie Andrew. And she wrote one of my letters of recommendation for PT school later on. Um, and she was employing something called dry needling, which I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It's a technique using acupuncture needles to actually treat trigger points and really stiff spots and muscles. Pretty amazing. It, it's one of those things like where it occurs as magic. If you've not seen it before, you're not prepared, like stick a needle into muscle. Oh, now thing move better. Um, so I saw that and I was like, okay, I have tools and I can make people move better, but those tool, those are power tools. You know, what you have is operating at a much higher level. And I wanted to be able to help people at that level and solve the problems at the higher level. And so I kind of decided, all right, I want to do physical therapy. So I went to an info session in 2014 for the University of Illinois, Chicago, which is that and Northwestern are kind of the only programs in Chicago for physical therapy. There are a couple in the suburbs, but I went to their info session, sat through it, was super into it, asked some, you know, uh, good questions and all that. I'm vibing. And I talked to the department administrator afterwards and I said, you know, here's my situation. I got a 2.3 GPA from the University of Chicago and an economics and physics major, but that was forever ago. I'm different now. Now I'm serious and I want to do this. So what do I need to do? And she was like, oh. I'm really sorry. That's what she said. She just said, I'm very sorry. Um, and I rode my bike halfway home. I got some gelato and I was like in tears on the phone with my dad. And I said, you know, I, my life is effed because of undergrad, you know, I'm never going to be able to do what I want to do because of my stupid undergrad. And he basically said, well, you know, there's, there are other programs besides the University of Illinois Chicago. And somebody, there's going to be a program out there that will take you if this is what you want to do. And um, I just kind of went for it. I, I started taking classes part time while I was working uh, at the gym. And I did that for a year. I applied to 14 physical therapy programs. I got into zero. I was like, okay, now it's kind of all or nothing here. And I quit my job. I went back to school full time. I took like maximum number of credits you can take in the interest of like putting space between my undergrad GPA and my application resume. I did that for a year. I applied to a similar number of PT programs the next year and I got an interview at Rhode Island and then I got into the University of Illinois Chicago. And I went there. Uh, it was awesome, but also like somewhat similar to the strength coach experience and that I realized like, oh, some of these people don't have that much to offer either. But I did learn a lot in terms of get going deeper on anatomy, kinesiology and applied anatomy and kinesiology and, you know, neuroanatomy, the interplay between the neuromuscular and skeletal systems and all that stuff. Um, so I did get a lot out of it. And then what was amazing about PT school is the clinical internships because you go into clinics and you work and you do it for 12 weeks at three different spots. And the first two of those, I just had incredible teachers who recognized that I had the goods that I like was not the average, uh, fresh out of college PT school student, but somebody who really like understood why he was there and what he wanted to do. And so they, really pushed me and gave me a lot of independence and leeway and stuff. And we had much more of like a peer to peer relationship than instructor student. You know, one, I had this incredible uh, clinical instructor, Kit Durbin, and he's still a very good friend of mine. And, and he's, I think, six years younger than me, but he's way ahead of me in his career. And he's a very brilliant physical therapist. So got a ton out of that. Graduated from physical therapy school, was president of my class, was ready for the victory lap, coronavirus changes some things, last clinical gets cut short, no graduation ceremony, all Zoom calls for the end of PT school. My wife is a linguistic anthropologist. Uh, she had just finished at, at the beginning of coronavirus, defended her dissertation at the University of Chicago in linguistic anthropology. 
she takes a postdoc at University of British Columbia. And we're thinking, all right, let's move. You know, she's a dual citizen. I'm thinking, hey, I can get a license there. I can get uh, immigrated to Canada. Surely it won't be that bad. Immigration process, very, very challenging. Just got my permanent resident card about a month ago after applying in uh, October of 2020. Physical therapy license process, intractable in Canada. Uh, there's a clinical exam where you have to do in person an in-person test for physical therapy. It's not just the written multiple choice test, which I've already taken and passed and had to go through all this process to have them check and see if my education was equivalent to theirs and all this stuff. But anyway, I've, I've done everything I can. I still can't get a physical therapy license in British Columbia. A couple of months ago, this uh, health change, my mom had a massive stroke, traumatic brain injury, came back to Michigan to help out with that got my Michigan license, got the in-person practice up and running. But through the midst of that immigration challenge and being in Canada and not having the ability to work in person or practice clinically, I had to do something. And I'd always wanted to have, I actually started the YouTube channel back when I was a strength coach and had made some videos that are still up there. They're somewhat decent content from back in the day. Um, but I thought, you know what, I'm just going to make a bunch of videos, make all of my exercises that I want to give to people as home exercises into videos. And then if nothing else, I'll have my whole exercise library for when I start my clinical practice and all my HEPs, home exercise programs, will just be links to videos and reps and it will be a great, you know, little add on to my service. And I thought if it turns into a marketing asset, great, I can do something with that. And I started doing Zoom calls with people just kind of doing I call it a, a movement coaching or a co movement consultation where we meet with you, we talk about all your problems. I'm not doing physical therapy where I'm doing a thorough exam, figuring out exactly what's wrong. But most people's problems are just low hanging fruit. That's the one thing you've got to learn across spending all this time teaching people how to move, seeing people in the clinic and figuring out, you know, diagnosable dysfunctions in a physical therapy setting or in a gym where it's just like, it's not, oh, I have, you know, uh, patellofemoral pain syndrome, but my knee hurts a little bit when I squat that, you know, solving all those different levels of problems. You just learn a lot of this comes down to just basic mismatch between what the human body evolved to do and what the human body does now. You know, we evolved to run around and hunt and gather and all that stuff and not have chairs. We live the way we do now. Your body adapts to that. You figure that out, you address the dysfunction, and then you the quality of your life improves. So anyway, that was my rambling uh, autobiography. I'm not sure what time you said between 30 <laughs> seconds and 30 minutes. So hopefully <laughs> I came in somewhere in the Oh, middle. you're totally in there. Yeah. Could have been two hours. It'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe to circle back to some details, I'd love to hear maybe uh -huh. a little bit more about what your training in physical therapy involved, like what that program yeah. involved and what you studied during that time. Yeah. So you know, to go to PT school, you have to have uh, some prerequisites. The biggest prerequisite for physical therapy is anatomy and physiology, the undergrad courses. So those are the really important things that, you know, other things matter, of course, that they require as well, you know, things like abnormal psychology, general psychology, uh, chemistry, physics, um, kinesiology, things like that. But anatomy and physiology is the big important thing to learn going in. And then it's also the main focus of the first semester of physical therapy school is just doing harder, higher level, deeper level anatomy and physiology courses. Uh, cadaver dissection is an important aspect, both before physical therapy school and during physical therapy school, learning the actual na physical nature of anatomy. And there's no way to do it without cutting up a cadaver. You just have to do it. And so, you know, I took before PT school an anatomy and physiology class and I got one of my letters of recommendation from an anatomy professor who was just awesome. This guy named Mike Jones. Um, and he just cared so much about it and just taught a really great course. And I, I learned a lot from him. And then I took another course from him, which was cadaver dissection. So I actually did the dissection, not just looking at it, but now you're doing it before PT school. And then the first year of PT school is a lot. The first semester is anatomy and uh, physiology of the entire body and you dissect most of the cadaver out. And then the second semester is neuroanatomy. So you do the brain and the nervous system. Um, and then like head and neck, I think we're, we're in the spring, but that's a lot of the foundational stuff. 
learning the actual physical structures of the body and you know, incredible detail. You just have to know that, like, if you're going to be manipulating a joint or mobilizing a joint or addressing a soft tissue dysfunction, you know, where the nerves are, where the arteries are, where the, how the connective tissue looks in there and what it feels like and all that stuff. Um, so that is definitely the most important and the most valuable thing for me. Then there are aspects of physical therapy that there are so many different things physical therapists do. And I don't know how much the general population even knows that, but children with neurodevelopmental disorders go to physical therapy and that's pediatric physical therapy is a, a whole branch of the profession. Cardiorespiratory physical therapy, you know, uh, rehabilitating patients from just cardiovascular issues, heart attacks, uh, you know, uh, emphysema, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, all these different things, um, heart failure, different things like that. It's mean more exercise driven, right? It's going to be more focused on, on hemodynamics, things like that. There is musculoskeletal physical therapy. That's kind of what I do, you know, outpatient, like solving orthopedic issues. Um, there's sports physical therapy, you know, treating and preventing sports injuries. There's, um, wound care as a type of physical therapy. Like hardly anybody knows that because it doesn't really make any sense, but the skin, the integument is considered part of the movement system. So wound care is a whole branch of physical therapy and different techniques to help crazy intractable, all various types of wounds heal. Um, so uh, neuro, and neuro is a huge thing, adult neuro. And that's what we're going through with my mom who had this stroke TBI is like, regaining function after a major injury or insult to the central nervous system. So anyway, you have to learn a little bit of all that different stuff. And um, basically that's what the coursework is. You know, there's a pediatric course, there's a motor control course, sort of more like adult, there's an adult neuro course. There's, um, you know, kinesiology, applied kinesiology course, all these different things. And then the third year is just clinical internships. So first two years, you know, first year, really foundational science, second year, more applied stuff, learning different branches of PT, and then uh, third year clinical internships. So that's kind of how it goes. Gotcha, gotcha. I'm imagining that in physical therapy, mm -hmm. there's a very like pragmatic approach of like whatever will work for the client that's in front of you. But yeah. I am curious if there's like a specific, I don't know, maybe like school of thought or something that you're using as a physical yeah. therapist that you follow. Yeah, I would say, you know, there are definitely like all these, like in any, I think, specific thing. So, you know, I think you have one, I know you have a, a diverse array of interests, but one thing is mindfulness, right? That's something that's a, a core piece, but you know, uh, of, of where your expertise lays. So I'm sure you understand all the different approaches to mindfulness that there are and different techniques. And some people are very dogmatic about this one or, or you know, flexible and, and interdisciplinary. And so there's a lot of that in physical therapy as well. Uh, you know, there's the McKenzie uh, physical therapist and they're like back pain all comes down to like, does it hurt when you go forward or does it hurt when you go backward? And that's what the treatment is. You know, if it feels better when you go back, you extend your spine a bunch of times and if it feels better when you go forward, you flex your spine a bunch of times. I'm oversimplifying, but like, that's a whole school of thought. There's Mulligan, uh, all of these different things doesn't matter. I just kind of go through, I've gone through all the experiences I've gone through and I've learned from a lot of different people. Um, and I am a curator of all of that experience and knowledge. And I pick a little here, a little there. There are some people who've like had a big influence on me. Kelly Starrett is a guy, Mobility Wad or used to be called Mobility Wad. Now it's called The Ready State is his company. And he's written a number of books, uh, Becoming a Supple Leopard, Desk Bound, things like that, Ready to Run. Uh, he made a huge impact on me. He was the first guy who kind of was like, you can treat your own problems for the most part. Not really advanced debilitating things. Lots of things require medical attention, but if it's just like your shoulder hurts, you can take a crack at it. And here's some stuff to do it. You know, just use a lacrosse ball, stick it here, move your arm around. And that was a big game changer in my thinking, a guy named Carl Powley, who actually worked at the same CrossFit gym as he did in San Francisco, former elite level gymnast, and was like, you have, you know, for the movement coach, for the trainer, understanding these big concepts about how the body moves locally and globally and applying those to your coaching um, and really understanding how to move 
more challenging ways, easier ways, make every movement scalable from easy, for example, with a push up, you can have your feet on the ground and your hands on the kitchen counter and do it with perfect technique where you maintain stability through your core and do the exact same movement you would want a person to do with a push up on the ground or uh, even more challenging feet elevated or even in a handstand, it's the same movement pattern. So being able to scale everything all the way down or all the way up, depending on the person's needs and the person's level. And um, there's a guy named Ben Patrick on YouTube, who's just a trainer. He's just a, a, a really, really, really good trainer. And he, his thing is, knee, he's the knees over toes guy on YouTube. That's his channel. And he has this company called ATG Online Coaching. And he has these incredible programs that are all based around this concept of rigorously loading every joint involved in a movement through a absolutely full range of motion. So being able to squat to where your hamstrings hit your calves and your ankle mobility is fully expressed and loading through that full range of motion again and again and again, and then increasing the range and increasing the load over time. It's such a basic concept, right? Get more flexible, get stronger through the full range of motion. Um, those are people, certain uh, you know, professors, or educators that I had, I mentioned Mike Jones, my anatomy teacher, Aaron Kyle was a professor I had in physical therapy school who was awesome. And I didn't get enough of him. He taught a class on something that's kind of stupid, which is modalities. That's things like if any, you or any of your uh, listeners have been to a physical therapist or had like a TENS unit, transcutaneous electro, uh, a transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. You put these little pads on people and you run shallow currents to their skin and it relieves their pain. It doesn't do anything. It's just stupid. It's just tricking your nerves for a second. Um, ultrasound. Because some physical therapists still do this crap, but like, you know, like you put this goop on people and you rub an ultrasound head on there and it puts waves to the muscles and warms up the tissue and stuff. Um, so he taught that class, but you could see that there was a mountain of knowledge underneath everything he said, and I wanted to see more of it. But um, yeah, that's a whole, I could talk all day about the University of Illinois Chicago physical therapy department. But the point is, I've taken a little bit here, a little bit there. My overall philosophy, as I mentioned earlier, quality over quantity. For example, a lot of people want to deadlift more or back squat more, but these are sort of like, especially, people who I think are going to be watching this podcast and who are, uh, you know, follow me on Twitter, follow you on Twitter might be into like quantifying everything, really tracking your progress and excruciating detail. And those are admirable things to do, but I will say this, being able to do a barefoot squat with your heel on the ground all the way down to where your hamstring is against your calf and your butt is on your ankle and your other foot is held up in the air and you go all the way down, hold that for a second, stand all the way back up. That is, Learning to do that is something one can train for and one can do things to make yourself better at doing it. And doing that will change the quality of your life much, much more than getting to be able to back squat 315 pounds. Back squatting 315 pounds is hard to do. I've done it. Um, but more people can back squat 315 pounds than can do the, the barefoot pistol squat I just described. And the people who can do the barefoot pistol squat are gonna be more difficult to injure they're going to be more resilient and they're just going to, the process of going from just wherever that person was beforehand to being able to do the barefoot pistol squat will improve their life more than the process of going from that same point to back squatting 315 pounds. So range of motion, strength through range of motion. These are the goals. That's what makes your life better. Being mobile, being stable, being pain-free. I think of it as like, an active life that is what I like to live. What I like to, I like to get out and play sports. You know, I got a basketball hoop in the driveway here at my parents' house. I'm playing basketball all the time now. I went hunting with a friend uh, a week ago. We were outside for 11 hours, you know, walking through marshy, mucky land, stepping over trees and holding a weapon. You know, that's, but being able to do all that stuff and not run out of gas, not exceed your limits and get injured. That's what makes a quality of life for me. And to do that, you increase range of motion, you'll load through the range of motion. That's basically what it is. And whether it's a different tool, whether we're using a foam roller to do some soft tissue work, whether you're doing stretches or you're doing, whether you're doing exercise, whether you're coming into my clinic and I'm using the super high power treatments on you, like dry needling, joint 
mobilization, manipulation, um, things like that. Or you're doing it to yourself, just rolling your foot on a lacrosse ball to improve your foot and ankle mobility. Um, there are different tools. I know a lot of them. I don't know all of them, uh, but I know more than most. And I have a lot to, I think, teach the average person when it comes to how to move better. Man, I really uh, circled back to the brand name there at the end, didn't I? Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, it's a good It's a good name for your project, Move Better Project. I, I like it a lot. Um, yeah, I'm curious, like, I know I've done physical therapy in person before, and mm -hmm. I can imagine what that's like, and you give some description for it, but you know, it is kind of unusual and a sort of a, a product of our times to do a consultation, as you say, on a zoom call. And I'd be yeah. curious to hear a little bit about what that's like and how you approach that. Yeah. So like my main, uh, service that I offer for just people who just want, you know, one interaction with me is it's a half hour Zoom call and it's a consultation. And we, you tell me usually ahead of time, they're sending me an email or using the forum that I use to book sessions to tell me what they want to, what the problem is that they're trying to solve. You know, I have, could be like, I have de Quervain's tenosynovitis, you know, like a very specific diagnosis of inflammation at the base of the thumb. Could be like, I get a little bit of back pain sometimes, or it hurts when I walk too far, or I have shoulder impingement, you know, whatever the problem is, can be very simple, could be very complex, could be well-defined, could be poorly defined. Some people are like, I don't know, I get kind of like tingly here sometimes after I type too long. Um, and that's not to mock any different thing that somebody's come to me with. They're all just problems that they're, usually the people who come to me are people who are interested in solving the problem on their own. They're doing research, they, they're motivated. And, um, so we talk about it, you know, they give me very specific details. What, when did it start? What do you think is causing it? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Where, what do you do when you're in a lot of pain to get out of pain? Um, what specific activities cause it to come on really bad? You know, things like that, you get a picture. And then for the most part, people's problems are somewhat common, like some people have very unique complex cases, but the vast majority of cases that people are trying to fix on their own, they're not seeing, you know, the medical establishment about are just basic stuff where it comes down to like, you know, I, you, you're having some shoulder pain because your shoulder sits like this all day. You're having some neck pain because you spend all day doing this. You know, you're having some back pain because you sit too, too much and you don't get enough hip extension in your life. Or, you know, you had a disc injury or some kind of like flexion trauma, whatever. And those things, there's a lot of stuff you could do to help, even if you can't completely fix it on your own. And I can also, you know, understand when the scope, when it's beyond my scope and hopefully advise you to seek some kind of, whether it's medical assistance or just an in-person physical therapy thing. But it's a very generalized approach to like solving your specific thing. And for the most part, I have the exercises and the YouTube channel that you're going to need to deal with it. You know, for example, let's just take like shoulder pain, very common thing, just general, like poorly defined shoulder pain, or maybe it's like, I don't know, rotator cuff or like front of my shoulder hurts, whatever. It's all fundamentally the same thing is your shoulder blade is supposed to sit back and down. And if you're watching the video, I'm doing a demonstration back and down like that. What it sits for most people is like this. And when you do that, you can try this little experiment. Let your shoulder blade come forward, reach up as high as you can. Hold your shoulder blade back and down, reach up as high as you can. They're a lot different. So if your shoulder blade is in the bad position, you're gonna have problems with the shoulder. So we work on the stiff muscles that kind of hold the shoulder in that position. Pectoralis minor is one under here. Uh, in the front of the armpit. We work on that. That's stiff on almost everybody. You rub that a little bit. If you're in my clinic, I can push on it with my thumbs or dry needle it or hit it with a Theragun and, you know, percussion vibrate it or scrape it with the uh, gua sha tool, whatever. I can do all these hands-on treatments. Or if you're at home, you just take a ball, hold up your arm, stick it in there and roll against the wall until it loosens up. Uh, we do the levator scapula, another muscle on the back that's stiff on almost everybody. Now we strengthen the muscles that are weakened, lower trap. You kind of get on all fours and do this Y exercise. You hold a resistance band, you pull it apart to squeeze the shoulder blades together. You do rows, you work on your external rotation to strengthen the rotator cuff muscles. Almost everybody has the same problems. Fundamentally, whether 
And, you know, in the clinic for physical therapy, I have to get a precise diagnosis and I'm going to take a ton of measurement and we're going to remeasure later because it's more scientific. It's more clinical, but more generalized. We still know the problem is going to fundamentally be the same and addressing the fundamental problem is probably going to end up fixing the downstream things. It might not. We might run into like, this helps, this doesn't, whatever. And then, you know, People email me, we, I update a Google doc with all the exercises I give them. Um, but it's just more of a service where I'm just showing you the roadmap. Here's how you can fix it yourself or at least make it better. And then you go home and do it. And if you wanna keep coming back and kind of have me check in with you, you can do that. You can just do the one-time deal, but that's kind of the uh, way that that service works. And then what I'm working on for the future uh, is more of like, prefabricated like rehab programs for these kind of very common things, you know, neck pain, uh, like desk neck, you know, my neck hurts after I work too long. That's kind of the same problem. Every, everybody's got the same thing, more or less. Some people are going to be different. Some people that approach isn't going to work and they're going to need to maybe go see a physical therapist or an in-person type of clinician to go deeper on it. Um, but generally it's kind of the same thing. So that's my approach. Um, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What are some of the other big problems that you see people come up with that are pretty common? Yeah, so I would say neck, probably the biggest one I've seen. And I think that the people who've found me, you know, recently through uh, Visa, Visa Canvi on Twitter, uh, the legend, um, and you and, and other people who've, who've uh, shown the light on me, uh, the inter-intellect person on a got, I think is how you say it, like reach out to me, I got a bunch of followers through her. But they're uh, thoughtful, kind of like, you know, nerdy, uh, interested people who want to learn, want to fundamentally understand things. And that's the people who I do well with because I'm going to tell you what's happening and hopefully in a way that you can understand it. Um, but because of that, a lot of those people work in tech or related fields and they have a lot of desk related dysfunction. So uh, neck pain, upper cervical pain due to forward head posture, probably number one. Uh, number two, just generalized back pain. Uh, issues with front of the hips being tight, back of the hips being weak um, from spending too much time in the chair. Uh, those would be definitely the two biggest ones. Shoulder pain, just overall this upper extremity, shoulder blade coming forward, thoracic outlet type symptoms, which is where you either have cool temperature or nerve symptoms down in the hand and the elbow and the forearm and things like that due to nerves being affected, either coming out of the neck or passing through the shoulder, which this whole thing sets that up mechanically to happen. Uh, when I said this whole thing, I stuck my head forward and rolled my shoulder forward. Uh, if you're not watching the video, um, that whole thing, uh, wrist and hand, a lot of people have stiff wrists and hands from, I think, you know, computer work fundamentally, but also just lack of strength and range of motion in the forearm muscles and in the intrinsic hand muscles. Um, elbow stuff, golfer's elbow, tennis elbow. Uh, I think I mentioned shoulder impingement issues going overhead with the shoulders. Um, knee pain, lots of knee pain, especially anterior knee pain, which relates to usually just lack of full range of motion in knee flexion extensions of being able to squat all the way down, stand all the way back up, deficits in ankle range of motion, uh, plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, tendinopathy. That would probably cover most of it. And then there are some more specific things here and there. Uh, but uh, I think most people, it's just kind of these general stiffness pain due to a lack of range of motion or a, a postural dysfunction or something that usually you can take a crack at and make better. What, what's, um, you know, I'm coming from a place of having knee and leg injuries. I, I'm not sure what's the difference between the contrast that's being made with anterior knee pain. Is that in contrast to a different kind or what are yeah, the Yeah, it's just, there? you know, there's, there's anterior knee pain, there's lateral knee pain, there's medial knee pain, there's mm -hmm. sort of joint or like internal knee mm -hmm. pain. Um, posterior knee pain. Some people get that with like, they lack knee extension. So a lot of people who, when you try to stretch your hamstring, feel it right behind the knee joint. That's where that the popliteal area is what that's called. Um, but any different, you know, 360 degrees in every dimension, something can be wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> basically with any joint. Most people just because of sitting the fundamental sitting where the hip flexors get short, one of the quad muscles 
rectus femoris crosses both the hip and the knee. So when you sit a lot, it gets tight at the top. And then that creates this whole pattern of excessive tension down the front of the leg. The shin muscles are tight and dysfunctional on a lot of people. So you kind of have this chain of muscle, bone, and connective tissue that's all connected. And you can, there's this guy named Thomas Myers who is a manual therapist. He's a, he's a massage therapist. I think it's his only qualification, but he has a book called Anatomy Trains that is like a real paradigm shifter for me and a lot of other people. Some people think it's, are not as impressed by it, but basically he's dissected out these trains of connective tissue that go through the entire body. So that's one train of connective tissue, quadriceps into the patella tent, the patella itself, the kneecap into where that inserts on the tibia and all the anterior muscles are all connected. And the connective tissue is one and the same because a lot of people think of like, okay, well, the rectus femoris is a quad muscle. Okay. So it attaches to the anterior inferior iliac spine on the top and it attaches to the patella and through the patella and the patellar ligament onto the tibial tuberosity of the tibia. Okay. So great. That's what it does. Right. And that's the end of that connection. And then the next connection starts down here and every muscle is in isolation, but what it really is on the anatomical level is the periosteum, the connective tissue that lines the hip bone doesn't just attach to the rectus femoris muscle. It becomes the tendon of the rectus femoris muscle at the top. Then it wraps that muscle. It wraps groups of muscle fibers. It wraps every fiber individually and it wraps little pieces of the fiber in there. There's all these little connective tissue layers that all form together. And then those become the quadriceps tendon that connects to the patella and envelops the patella and becomes the patella. And that becomes the tendon that connects to the tibia and so on. So it's really, there are structural, functional, and mechanical connections that go beyond just one joint, beyond just one muscle. So anyway, that's just to say that usually if you have the knee, I had this great clinical instructor, Nate Klosterman, who owns a clinic in Northwest Indiana that I had to go to. Uh, I commuted from Chicago or reverse commuted about an hour each way. Um, and it was awesome. Like I learned so much from him. It, it, you know, you would normally think that would be a, a, a burden to have to commute, but this was a joy because he was such a great clinician, but he used to say, he kind of had this, this Michigan, Indiana, Midwestern accent. You go, you know, the knee is a dumb joint. It does what the hip and the ankle tell it to do. Um, and that's absolutely true. So if the front of your shin, the tibialis anterior muscle is really stiff and all that connective tissue is stiff and it's creating tension, pulling on the anterior knee from below and the anterior thigh, the quad muscles are stiff and tight as they are in a lot of people who spend too much time sitting, that's pulling on the anterior knee from above. And then we have a breakdown in the chain because there's all this tension pulling on the anterior knee. There's not enough of a balance of forces from quads and hamstrings and anterior shin muscles and calves and all these things are not in balance. There's a lack of range of motion. Usually people have a hard time bending their knee fully and getting, you know, hamstring against calf when they have anterior knee pain, especially, um, you know, under load. Uh, so like sitting on your heels can be agony for these people. Um, so what do you do? You just address all those dysfun dysfunctions. You deal with the tissue stiffness in the quad, deal with the tissue stiffness in the shin load those tissues through a full range of motion, you know, doing, I have exercises like the natural knee extension, uh, elevated ATG split squat. These are all YouTube videos I have that you, once you've smashed the quad and you smash the tibialis anterior and you've done uh, the voodoo band, which is the muscle floss band. I have a lot of videos using that. These are really powerful techniques that the everyday person has access to, to dramatically improve your range of motion quickly. And people are usually shocked that you can roll around on a foam roller for five minutes and actually make a difference. But if you do it right, you can, but it's not, you know, it's not the tool, it's the method. So it's doing it with the right technique. So spending time going slowly, applying pressure to the tender spots, using your breath and, you know, your brain to contract the muscle, relax the muscle, bring awareness to that stiffness and consciously reduce it. Then you can load it through a full range of motion. Then it gets more resilient everything gets better over time. So 
that's a lot of philosophy as well as just kind of anatomy mixed in there. But that's one example for anterior knee pain. Lateral knee pain relates to lateral thigh and hip and shin dysfunction. Medial knee pain, same thing. I think you're getting the picture here. But um, yeah. The adjective is like where it shows up essentially. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. there's different, there's so many different structures around the knee, right? Mm-hmm. You got patella, the femur, the tibia, the fibula. Those are just the bones. Then we have all the different muscles that insert the cross in the area, connect to that general area. Anything with a connective tissue uh, connection, you know, all the way up from the anterior hip and even above uh, down to, you know, below. And so all of those things are going to be factors or any number of th- those things could be a factor is a better way to say it. And they probably all are to varying degrees. So taking a shotgun approach where I don't spend in the clinic, I'm going to figure out exactly which one is the most one and we're going to prioritize and be laser focused. But if you're just doing it on your own, you can just attack all of that. It doesn't cost you any money to foam roll. You, you got to buy a foam roll or whatever, but that costs 12 bucks on Amazon. And, and that's not really a limiting factor for most people is the equipment. You don't need expensive equipment. Um, you just need the right, you just need to understand how to do these things that everybody's doing. Yeah. And just want to recommend to the listener, Sam's video on foam rolling is really terrific and uh, yeah, has a specific instructions for how to do that in a way that I found really helpful. Thank um, you. Yeah. I'd be curious to hear you sort of alluded to this, but it, it sounds like you're hoping to make like an offering mm-hmm. that has different uh, programs for different people with these common yeah. problems. And what do you envision that looking like? Yeah. So the first one is this IT band syndrome, which is actually lateral knee pain. Uh, related to the discussion we just had but um what i've basically got in mind is a written document that's pdf that explains you know with references written at a a level i think that most everybody can understand certainly the people who are coming after me where i don't treat you as an idiot that's one thing like a lot of physical therapists think the clients are idiots and cannot understand anything and everything must be dumbed down. I'm going to use some terminology and they're hopefully in a way that's still understandable and relatable, but explain the nature of the problem and explain the rehab approach. And then I have videos that are not just on my YouTube channel. They're unlisted that a walk through and introduce the anatomical kinesiological, whatever, you know, the concepts you have to understand to what went wrong to cause this and how to go about fixing it on your own. And then rehab sessions or just half hour ish follow along videos going through every single exercise you need to do. And I'm just doing them with you. And, you know, we got the camera set up and, and uh, you know, just going through everything and you just, and their chapter marks. So if you find specific exercises are helpful, you can go right to those. And then uh, sort of everything ranging with those rehab sessions from like what to do when you're totally on fire and in pain and can barely move all the way to returning to sport. So with IT band syndrome, the, the sport at, at fault slash involved slash that people want to get back to is usually running. So I go over the very last thing is running technique and drills to relearn and reestablish a functional running technique that's going to be better in the future at keeping this from happening again, happening again and uh, making you more resilient. And, you know, it's not just tissues, right? It's not just strength and range of motion. It's also skill in movement. So uh, running is just one example of movement that you, one, one's life and one's running improve when one is able to run better. There is a way to run for most everybody uh, that's better than other ways to run. Some people kind of have the, I think I have in some ways, my wife definitely thinks that I am inflexible in some ways and thinking that there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. Uh, you know, she gets sick of me saying, for example, trying to insist that she cut an onion in the proper knife skills chef way. Um, but for the most part, you know, I, my uncle taught me how to score baseball games when I was a kid, we were at a baseball game together. And I don't know if people are familiar with what that means, but there's sort of a grid type sheet that you fill out when you're watching a baseball game and there's symbols and ways to record everything that happens in the game. So very old timey kind of thing to do, but I grew up doing it and my uncle taught me. And he was saying that people have different ways of writing uh, a fly out. And he used F8, which is the technically correct way to do it. So he said, some people like to write an eight and circle it. And some people like to do this. And he said, 
you know, and people will say, well, I prefer this and I prefer that. And he said, can you swear on this podcast? Sure. Go for it. Okay. He said, well, fuck your, I prefer and do it the right way. <laughs> and <laughs> there is some people will say, you know, oh, well, you know, there's, there's some people are pronators and some people are this, and I prefer to run like this. And after that, it's like, okay, well, kind of after I prefer and learn how to run properly, and then you won't get hurt. Um, mm. That's a little bit, a little taste of <laughs> getting coached by me. <laughs> uh-huh. So the first program will be kind of like on IT band syndrome, and it'll exactly. have written documents and videos and kind of walkthroughs yeah. and things. Exactly. Uh, are there any other programs that you're planning to do in the future when you finish that one? Yeah, absolutely. I think neck pain is kind of the biggest, as I mentioned, that's the number mm-hmm. one thing that people are asking me about is neck pain dysfunction. So I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit for people uh, there. And even if you just, you don't necessarily have like, you're in agony and can't function. It's just like you get stiff sometimes. That, that's all a spectrum, I think, mm-hmm. that people can meet anywhere along that spectrum and do something to probably get better. Um, And it's another one of these just mismatches, right? Your, your head is all the anatomy is structured in a way for your head to be held up on top of your shoulders. And there should be a little curve of extension, kind of like, you know, where it's concave, the back is concave and the front is convex. uh, If you're just listening Um, and people end up in this position called forward head posture, where the bottom is flexed and the top is extended. And so the muscles at the top get stiff and the muscles at the bottom get weak. And the muscles on the front that tuck the chin and keep the upper cervical spine flexed get weak and inactive. And so just correcting all that dysfunction, you know, with soft tissue work, uh, massage, different things, and then just exercises to reestablish that more functional posture. And it's another thing, just like I mentioned with the shoulder, if your whole shoulder blade is rotated forward, you don't have much range of motion. If your head is out in front of your body, you don't have much range of motion. If your head is back, you have way more range of motion to express. So you're going to have more of a buffer between you and pain when you do something extreme. And a lot of people get stiff and then something happens and they get really messed up. You know, like they, they reach to pull something, oh, my neck hurts. And then I couldn't move for a week. So it's about a getting you out of those states of pain and, and immobility and spasm and things like that. But B also just improving your overall range of motion and your resilience and to injury. And I, I don't want to say like prevent injuries because injuries are not preventable by definition. Uh, there's like things happen, you know, you can still get hurt, even if you're very strong, very flexible, it's just less likely. So you'll kind of work through each of these major things that people keep coming to for and make programs for them. Yeah. And it's, you know, Jack Butcher is a guy, I don't know if people are familiar with him uh, on Twitter and he, he has a brand called Visualize Value. And I've gotten a lot of mileage out of his concepts when it comes to building your brand. And he kind of talks about build once, sell twice. The idea that you can put a lot of upfront work into something and make a, a sort of product. And that's what we're talking about here that then can be sold uh, to multiple people and help more people. Um, and he also talks about sell your sawdust. So every time a client comes to me with a problem, I have to develop materials to help that client. And so that is sawdust. And right now that's YouTube videos, which, you know, work and bring more attention to me and people booking consults and hopefully buying programs in the future. But it also forces me to think through these things and, I have to, I kind of have, you know, in my head, these treatment plans that I will give to people that uh, come to me with that thing. So I might as well just record what I've given them and use that as the structure the the plan, the the bare bones that I build out into a program that can then, again, build one soul twice and and help more people. Definitely, definitely. It seems like uh, a lot of your work is focused on yeah, like if someone's got pain, like helping them with that issue. And yeah. um, and then of course you wanna, you were talking about sort of improving things after that, improving their range yeah. of motion, the strength. Is there anything that you like to do or that you would endorse that's sort of preventative for folks? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I am far from perfect and I'm a work in progress. And I think it's completely disingenuous to pretend that I'm not. Uh, or that I've like figured everything out or I'm some like specimen of perfection. That is not it at all. I am always working on myself 
and trying to reify my philosophy in physical form by by practicing that. And I'm not talking about perfecting myself. It's just about being always in a process of evaluating what's not working, what's working today. You know, I did, um, you know, I spent, I had a couple of friends visit over the weekend and uh, we had a great old time. They're friends that I played baseball in high school with and we've been, you know, friends for a long time. And we were running around throwing the football and having a great time. But obviously at 35, I get a little sore and stiff after that. So I need to recover from that. So today I worked on, you know, opening up the front of my chest, which gets really stiff in that, you know, front of the armpit area. I did some treatments uh, on myself there to improve the range of motion. And then I went outside and I did various exercises to open up that uh, range of motion and uh, some, I had some elbow issues that come up when I throw the ball. So I worked on some grip training and just the same kind of things I'm talking about professing for other people. I just did it for myself in terms of, uh, loading tissues through a full range of motion and stretching them out and trying to increase my range of motion and my strength, uh, through those areas. But yeah, I have a number of things I'm, you know, working towards. I try to have some kind of a goal that I can think about training for. Um, and mine tend to be more task oriented. So with my lower body, what I'm working on right now is that barefoot pistol squat I mentioned earlier. Um, because if I'm going to talk about how that's so important, I should probably be working on doing it myself. So I work a lot on ankle flexibility. And that means, you know, doing uh, soft tissue work on my calves and feet, wrapping them with the, the, the floss band and increasing range of motion, going out, doing loading exercises, their full range of motion, deep squatting in different angles and positions. Um, I'm working on redeveloping. I used to be able to do it and I have lost the ability, but I'm, I'm well on my way back to getting it back of, of doing a strict muscle up. So hanging below the rings and pulling yourself up through and then doing a dip to where you're supported on top of the rings. Um, which I did a lot of those swinging around and kipping and, you know, taking my shoulder to and well past its breaking point when I was doing CrossFit. So now more like, can I reclaim all that range of motion slowly with a lot of strength and a lot of, uh, uh, stability, um, you know, things like that. So in terms of my movement practice, I basically, yeah, I'm spending a lot of time right now in the hospital, taking care of my mom and supervising her as she recovers from her uh, brain injury. Um, she requires a lot of supervision. You know, when you're missing a third of your skull, you, you really don't want to fall. I'll just say that as a general rule. Um, but when I'm home, I wake up in the morning, I take Ted, uh, this big golden retriever who's hanging out with us. Um, take him for a big walk. We play fetch. I get outside, I'm running around and moving. And then I come home. And we've got all our workout equipment out in the garage here. And it's late November in Michigan and it's cold, but I go out there and I work out and I usually work out shirtless uh, and in bare feet in the cold. I'm a big fan of cold exposure. I don't talk about, I haven't talked about that so much on the channel yet. I have a video shot of me swimming in a lake in British Columbia in uh I think in October where it was pretty cold and talking about some, some cold exposure. So hopefully I can get that up. But I work out out there and I do the same stuff that I profess. It's all exercises that I either have videos of or will have videos of soon. And just the same concepts that I'm talking about with you applied to me and where my weaknesses are of where do I lack strength? Where do I lack range of motion? And how can I attack that? And sort of, you know, what I try to have is sort of this physical independence and, and mastery and ability to get into and out of a lot of different positions and to be able to do a lot of different stuff without having any pain or, or dysfunction. So that's kind of what it looks like for me in terms of training. Um, and yeah, did I answer your question? Sorry, I talked for a while. I kind of forgot Definitely. what yeah, you initially act. Yeah, I did. Yeah, <laughs> I, did. Um, I don't know. It seems like one, um, principle sort of underlying a lot of this is just that like body issues are often solvable problems uh yeah, and you've talked sure. about other sort of principles of you know extending range of motion mm -hmm. adding strength ability to those range of yeah. motion things like that um maybe like working with things that are adjacent to wherever there's pain you know like yep. the hips yeah, upstream and, and downstream is kind of how i i what i call that concept 
the idea that you, if the knee is just a great example, like if the front of your knee hurts, look at the front of your shin and the front of your thigh and mm -hmm. the front of your ankle and the front of your hip. And if the, uh, your elbow hurts, look at your forearm and, you know, your shoulder and let's figure out where, you know, there is stress and inflammation at some spot. So what in that chain also is dysfunctional because odds are it's not just the elbow, the shoulder and the, the wrist are going to have dysfunction and maybe even up into the neck and upper back and uh, hand. And so, you know, addressing upstream and downstream of the problem, think of it like, you know, a link of a chain has broken. So feed slack to the broken link so that you can repair it. Hmm. If it's under tension, it will not be able to repair. Are there any other sort of principles or patterns that you find yourself uh, coming back to that you haven't mentioned already? Yeah, I think one is, and this is a specific one, but I think it relates to a different concept that I don't talk about as much, which is stability. Hmm. Um, I talk a lot about mobility and strength through range of motion. That's where most people are, have deficits, but people have deficits in stability as well. And especially if someone is more flexible or more mobile or maybe even hypermobile, um, but maybe they're just like less stable. So like people who have a lot of experience in yoga, for example, some people who are very beautiful yoga practitioners, and by that, I mean, the way they move is beautiful and, and coordinated can still have dysfunction in terms of like back pain where it's more lack of stability. Um, and I'm not saying yoga doesn't train stability or anything. I'm just talking about a general concept. Uh, please do not come after me. Yogis. I, I love yoga. Um, but, um, yeah, so I think stability. So for example, a lot of people, what's the most, what, if I, you think of one exercise for the abs, what do you think of? Oh, I guess crunches, maybe crunches, crunches or sit-ups is usually what people are going to say. A flexion exercise where you're actively flexing, but how many times a day do you flex your trunk? Hmm. For most people, once <laughs> when you get out of bed, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Um, that's not really what those muscles do. What they do is they resist extension. So when you're training your abs, and this is something I talked about, I gave a whole talk to the Northwestern University Sports Performance Department on how to train abdominals and core based on the principles of who, what athletes have the strong, most core strength. Like if you were just thinking like top of your head, just which athlete, you know, Olympic sport, competitive sport, whatever, what, what do you, who do you think would have probably have the strongest core muscles? Oh gosh. You know what, there's, know. it's not, I'm not looking for a right answer. Just what do yeah. you think about, you know, maybe, maybe like lifters or something like that. Lifters could be one. I would posit gymnasts okay. would be probably the best bet. They're often able to hold static positions under extreme duress, whether it's like an L sit where your hands are on the ground and the feet are straight out and their legs aren't touching or handstand or, you know, different, very challenging positions, ring, uh, you know, iron cross, things like that. So front lever hanging on the rings, body held totally straight. That's going to place a big demand on the abs. What they do to train abdominal strength is things like hollow holds where your lower back is on the ground and you're in a straight line. And I have videos on this concept as well, but they resist extension. So what your abdominals do to prevent your back from hurting or getting overextended is they contract and they pull the, your rib cage and your pelvis, the front of your pelvis closer together, but mainly they don't pull them together to concentrically contract. They eccentrically or isometrically contract to resist extension. So abdominal training should be about resisting extension. But if you kind of zoom out on what I'm talking about here is I'm saying like use you know, train your movement system, whether it's muscles, bones, joints, whatever, to uh, be able to handle a lot of resistance, you know, because what's going to prevent your back from hurting is being able to really resist extension powerfully with your abs or resist flexion with the muscles of the lower back, you know, not necessarily um, concentric strength, although that's good in both cases. It's good to be able to concentrically contract from a fully extended position and pull yourself back to neutral. It's good to concentrically contract your lower back and get yourself from flexion to extension, but it's also important to be able to resist those movements. So 
that concept of stability, preventing movement that you don't want can be incredibly powerful and valuable for people who have different dysfunction and also just the average person, just the average person who just wants to not have something go wrong. Um, and, you know, let me think about where else stability would matter. You know, the knee joint, can you keep it, you know, from collapsing inward when you're in the bottom of the squat? Can you keep it in line or your knees in line with your hips and ankles? Uh, different things like that, you know, can some people have different situations, you know, like some people's elbows hyperextend. So in order to manage that, you need to be able to find neutral and stabilize, prevent excessive flexion, prevent excessive extension. So I think you marry that concept of being able to control and resist different movements throughout the range of motion to with increasing the range of motion and increasing the strength through the full range of motion. You put those two together and that is most of human movement, like nine, a, a lot. I don't know if it's all of it, but that will get you a lot of mileage. If you take those two concepts and apply them rigorously to anywhere where you're having dysfunction or where you just want to prevent dysfunction or you need to increase performance because it's all the same spectrum, you know, dysfunction, function, performance is kind of a, a straight line that you move. Uh, you want to move towards performance wherever you are. Uh, on that. Hmm. seems like, um, another big thing in your approach is, and this is common to other things as well, but it's just sort of like understand the underlying mechanics or source of problems. And, yeah. um, you know, at, in your, all your videos, you have like really good explanations of what's happening and, uh, mm -hmm. why the things are the way they are. And, uh, I, yeah, maybe this is more of like a personal question, but I find for myself, Please. With, with those kinds of things like, um, oh, I don't know, since, since I haven't had formal training in anatomy or things like that, like some, some yeah. of the concepts can be kind of hard to wrap my head around. And I was wondering like, what helps you remember the different things and like, what would you suggest to someone who's like learning about these things through your program to like help them yeah. kind of internalize the underlying workings of whatever the issue is? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. So, you know, one thing that I really believe and is part of my like core philosophy as a physical therapist, movement coach, whatever you want to call what I do, um, is to tell people the truth. And that's something that, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, there are a lot of physical therapists out there, strength coaches out there who think that people are just too stupid to understand the real thing. And this really comes up, this came up, uh, in CrossFit a lot in the world of CrossFit. Um, and I'm not saying anything bad about every single person in CrossFit or anything like that. It's just, you know, there are certain things that worked and I think that, di that didn't work about that company, movement philosophy, all that stuff. One thing was they would talk a lot about, it's like, you know, lumbar curve. So the idea that you should keep your lower back extended when you're moving. And that's not accurate. That's not the whole truth. What's best is to be able to move through a full range of motion, control that full range of motion, but also choose to not move the lower back, choose to keep it stable. If you're doing a heavily loaded squat, for example, or a deadlift to be able to move a load that is it through your shoulders, whether it's sitting on top of a barbell or hanging with a barbell or in a kettlebell and a goblet squat, whatever move through your hips, knees, and ankles, which are the strong, powerful joints where you're trying to train them to get stronger and stabilize through the middle. But people think that that concept is too much for a lot of people. So they say, no, 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 nobody's gonna understand that if you start talking about that, that they can't get it, they won't get it. That's something I heard so many times when I was a strength coach. They're not gonna get that. You can't say it like that. It's like, are they not gonna get it or do you not get it? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And I think in a lot of cases for the strength coach, CrossFit coach, personal trainer, whatever, the truth is they don't get the level mm -hmm. of complexity. And so therefore they certainly don't get it at a level where they could teach it to somebody else. So the re I think, you know, that's been a common positive feedback. I think that I've gotten is what you just said, that you explain things, the underlying issue, you explain it very well in a clear way that people can understand. And this is not to toot my own horn. It's just like my experiences. I understand it really well so I can teach it to others. That's just a basic concept. I think of knowledge is that to teach something to someone else, you have to understand it very deeply or more deeply than they do. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to, you know, get the, the entire picture and then distill the important things down and communicate them in a clear way. So for me, my brain works in ways that I'm trying to connect 
a system of knowledge together that makes sense and is coherent. You know, I think the schema might be a term for that type of, of, you know, knowledge map. And I'm trying to find connections and look for what's, you know, what are the rules that apply to everything and what, you know, what are the exceptions to those rules? What's something that could disprove my existing thing and for, or force me to change and adapt? Like very recently in the last year, I found this guy, Ben Patrick, Knees Over Toes guy. And I was just like, okay, yeah, this is better than what I'm doing for knees. This is what, just a better approach for lower body strength. Like I immediately knew it was like, okay, he's using great principles and he's applying them rigorously and he's doing it better than I am. So mm -hmm. throw some of what I've got in the trash, keep the best parts, take the best parts of what he's doing, learn them really deeply. So I understand it just probably as well as he does, uh, you know, and I bring my experience, my body of knowledge to the same concept of movement, whether it's an ATG split squat or anything else. And then update the overall system and then apply it forward. And it's kind of, you know, I think we're just kind of talking about the process of learning and teaching more so than the pro than specifics of anatomy here. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what's called for in this. Cause you asked me like, how do you get better at understanding this? How do you get better at teaching it? You just have to get better at understanding something. So it's the same rule, no matter what it is, you know, it's this process of like some people, I think it's like this, statistical term is Bayesian. You, you have the existing data and then you incorporate new events into that and it moves the thing, you know, a little bit in this direction rather than radically going back and forth. Um, another concept I think of learning that I find useful is the Hegelian dialectic. That you have this conversation between whether you want to think of them as extreme or opposed viewpoints that from that conversation, the overall com base of knowledge and the, the level of the conversation elevates by going back and forth between different ideas, you know, and as a physical therapist, for example, pain science is something we haven't talked about much. I don't talk as much about, but it's something I want to talk more about the idea that pain is not something that happens in the tissues. Pain is a sensation that occurs in the brain. So to, to say here, what do I mean by that? People who have had a limb amputated still experience something called phantom limb pain, where they experience pain in the limb that no longer exists. So that cannot be pain in the tissue because there is no tissue. So the pain occurs in the brain. That's not saying it's all in your head if you're in pain, especially if you're in chronic pain, but the nervous system, both the sensory nerves going back to the spinal cord and the brain itself, and then going the other direction, it's related to this experience of pain. And addressing that nervous system and the thoughts and the especially fearful thoughts around movement can have a major impact on pain, especially chronic pain. And helping people to understand, you know, the way that their brain and their thoughts and their psychology relate to their physiology. And those are not separate concepts, but they're the same concept. Um, that's something that you know, you might think would be in opposition to what I talk about a lot, which is addressing tissues. But into like a midbrain person, they are, right? It's like, no, it's pain science. No, it's tissue loading. No, it's soft tissue work, whatever. No, it's all those things. But the conversation of arguing manual therapy is everything versus like pain science is everything, like from different people who might think those or be different parts along the spectrum, I can learn from both and elevate what I'm doing, hopefully, over time and continue to learn. So I think that got a little philosophical, but hopefully that, that helps in terms of like understanding the system. And I try to, you know, give people everything they need to understand the systems involved in say like IT band syndrome or lateral knee pain. But the more, you know, if you're interested in it, there's just always more you can learn about anatomy, kinesiology, movement, just, you know, I could, uh, I'd be happy to put together a little reading list maybe that I can send you um, on some, some, some texts that have been good for me or, or had a lot of good stuff in them, but uh, none of those texts is a Bible. You know, nobody is, is, to me, you know, I could, somebody, have, people have written their Bibles and I might someday write mine, but it's, it's just like, I don't know, they're all p important pieces of knowledge along the way. But I think, um, 
yeah, just learning more about the fundamental systems, I would say, and trying to view your knowledge as a system of interconnected pieces and build that system out. Mm. Is there anything that you're hoping to learn more about yourself in your own uh, like studies of all of this stuff? Yeah, I think, you know, one growth area for me is actually, I think, an area where you're really strong is mindfulness. Mm. Um, I am pretty good at incorporating, you know, sort of living my philosophies, you know, with, and it comes and goes in terms of like how rigorous I am with different things or how, you know, uh, uh, particular I'm about following different regimens that I set out for myself, but, you know, nutrition, sleep, exercise, cold exposure, sun exposure, uh, having a rich social life connections, uh, you know, I think having a dog, spending a lot of time with animals for me is something that really fills my cup and makes my life better family, friends, all that stuff. But I know, you know, I've worked on, and again, that's one of those things where it's like, oh, what does that look like? You've worked on it, huh? <laughs> um, but I've, you know, I've taken a class in mindfulness-based stress reduction. I've had streaks of, of times where I've meditated more, meditated less, um, you know, tried different teachers, different things like that. But definitely something that I know the benefits of. I see the benefits of. I've read the research. I'm very clear that it's something that benefits everybody that I particularly would benefit from as somebody who's, uh, you know, I, I'm a person with depression and, and I, you know, take an antidepressant and it's just a factor in my life, something I deal with, try to address it in a lot of different ways, but I know mindfulness practice really helps with that. And, you know, I do a lot of things mindfully, I'm very mindful when I'm exercising. That's one of the things I love about exercise is I'm really completely focused on what I'm doing. Um, you know, I really, I went on a hunting trip I mentioned and part of deer hunting involves sitting very still for a very long period of time and cultivating a very intense awareness of your surroundings. So, you know, I see the benefits. Do I practice it every day? No. So that's, I think, something that I want to incorporate more of um, both just in my life practice for myself and that I think, you know, making a part of my, um, you know, what I sell, not sell, but like what I tell other people to do. I, it's, I don't, wouldn't have any integrity right now and being like, you need to have a mindfulness practice. Like it would just be ridiculous because I don't have one myself, but I think that that's something that I know is really beneficial and it's beneficial with, uh, musculoskeletal pain, you know, um, beneficial with chronic pain, but it's also just beneficial with basic being a human being in the world. Um, and that's one thing, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, this kind of concept of mismatch diseases. So there's this anthropologist named Daniel Lieberman, and he is an evolutionary biology slash anthropology guy. And he's like the barefoot anthropologist. And he wrote a book called the story of the human body. And it's basically about how evolution created the ways in, in which anatomy or anatomy and kinesiology relates to how we evolved. Um, and he's really into barefoot running and things like that. But he talks about a lot of diseases like diabetes or myopia, you know, nearsightedness as being mismatched diseases. We evolved to live outside and look out into the distance. We now stare at computer screens and read books and things. So we get nearsighted. It's just a mismatch between how it's designed and how it's used. Um, you know, and a lot of psychological dysfunction, I think is the same way. It's a mismatch between how we're designed to live or how we evolved to live, the way that that life looks versus the way the modern environment looks. And I think that mindfulness is something that can really help bridge that gap. But again, it's not, uh, it, I have a lot of room to grow in that area. Mm. Also makes me curious if there are any like sort of open questions in physical therapy or about the body of like things that aren't very well understood? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, just back pain, hmm. back pain is just a gigantic, um, there's a lot we understand about back pain and different specific mechanical issues with back pain, but it like for so many people have chronic long-term back pain, you know, just in the general population, it's a, it's almost an epidemic, uh, in Western society, especially the United States. Um, but okay, what is back pain? It's not, back pain is not a thing. There's a lot of different mechanical diagnoses that cause pain in the back. There's just a lot of people just have chronic 
pain in their back, no matter what they do, or that's ill-defined, or that's just kind of generalized. And there, you, you can talk to 10 physical therapists about what causes a certain type of back pain and get 10 answers. And it's very dogmatic at times, and it's very uh, entrenched. And physical therapists also broadly maybe have one type of approach, whereas chiropractors have another one, whereas orthopedic and neurosurgeons have a third. And everybody thinks, not everybody, but a lot of people in those different camps think that they have all the answers. Um, but there's so much involved. You know, the psychology and pain science, of course, matter. If you have chronic back pain and you're, you're fearful of doing any physical activity because you're worried that it might hurt your back, of course, that's going to have a psychological factor to it. it might have a mechanical factor as well. Um, probably does, probably may, might be all mechanical, might have once been mechanical and now be just total chronic pain, not have anything to do with tissue at all. Um, and that's just one thing, but that's maybe the most common physical therapy thing you deal with in clinical practice is lower back pain. But, you know, how much do we know about lower back pain? Really? You know, we think we know a lot. We have a lot of different data and a lot of different information, a lot of things that work sometimes, but there's no, just like, nobody's come out with like, the back pain solution. Lots of people have entire philosophies and structures uh, and practices around treating the lower back. A lot of people have had a lot of success, but nobody's got it cracked. Nobody's just like cracked the case on back pain. I think I have a really effective approach for especially uh, extension-based back pain, which is what most people have. And I have a playlist on my YouTube channel just called extension-based back pain that people can check out if they have that, which, and again, that's most of people who sit too long, their hip flexors get tight, their lower back gets overextended or too much extension, not enough hip extension, their butt is weak or inactive, whatever. That's kind of um, a very common part of back pain. But um, yeah, so there are a lot of things. I don't know that like anything is super well understood in terms of physical therapy. Like the research in physical therapy ranges from like you know, here's a case series of like a very specific set of treatments that I did for this specific diagnosis and it worked perfectly, you know, or like here's a more experimental thing to like, here's a systematic review and meta-analysis that says exercise is good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and a lot of it is the second one. It's a lot of like, did you know that exercise lowers your blood pressure? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, -huh. uh, so yeah. So, so it's either like hyper specific to a specific client or it's like over overly general. Yeah. And also a lot of people like trying to draw conclusions that maybe are, are draw very aggressive conclusions that aren't supported by data or um, just sort of captain obvious type mm -hmm. stuff, you know, um, like exercising hip muscles makes hip muscles stronger. Like mm -hmm. I swear to God, that's a lot of like physical therapy research papers is like doing glute bridges make glutes stronger. Uh -huh. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> uh, yeah, right, right. That's funny. Huh. I, I mean, if there, uh, this is just a random question, but if there was like yeah. an alternate universe where mm -hmm. you got like, you know, $50 million to do physical therapy research, is there anything that mm -hmm. you'd want to investigate? Oh yeah. No, I mean, it would be, it would be big, uh, you know, high end, like pretty high powered studies comparing specific interventions for specific things. Um, so, you know, um, just take a specific diagnosis, like Achilles tendonitis. Let's do one control group that just does these exercises. Another one does the exercises, plus they get dry needled. The third one does the exercises, plus they do, you know, hands-on manual therapy exercises, plus, you know, um, scraping instrument assisted plus uh you know uh pain science education all these and do every different combination of that you can see how this could get expensive very fast um but that kind of thing for different diagnosis and then big uh you know just i would say the big thing a big problem i think in physical therapy is like examination like how do you actually do a very scientific examination. So um, just research into different tests and measures and the importance of things like objective data on strength, range of motion. There are things in physical therapy called special tests, which just means, for example, like special tests is, I'm doing it on the video, hand on the opposite shoulder, touch your elbow to your uh, nose. 
that's a test for shoulder impingement. It's called um, uh, the near impingement sign. I think that's right. Uh, and then there's one, we joke that it's positive on almost every human being for shoulder impingement. This test, you, they lay on the back, hold their arm like this and you twist it you, like that. It's called the Hawkins Kennedy test. And like Nate, that uh, physical therapist from Indiana that was my clinical instructor, we used to jokingly just write HK plus on the exam sheet before a shoulder patient came in because you knew it was going to be positive. Uh -huh. um, but uh, yeah, just rigorously like testing all that stuff and finding out like, because there's a million of those things. I don't actually like, there's some data out there, but it's kind of crappy. Like, just like, let's really find out what works in terms of examination and then really find out what works in terms of treatment and uh, come up with some evidence that supports or denies what we think is true in terms of those things. Um, because that would be, that would be actually useful because a lot of people in physical therapy talk about evidence-based practice. It gets taught in school. We have multiple classes on, you know, evidence in practice, understanding how to evaluate evidence and you doing your practice. But a lot of the evidence, as I said earlier, is just crap. Like the, the research is crap. You know, it's like manual therapy, you know, is no better than exercise for ankle, uh, you know, post ankle sprain. Like, and it's like, okay, but what is manual therapy? Like, are you doing the same soft tissue thing with the same skill and the same pressure and the same lo exact location that I'm doing it? You know, I don't know. Can that be studied? And like, so they're difficult questions, I think, to answer when it comes to physical therapy, clinical practice, but the evidence is not getting it done at present. I would say that. Mm. Well, I'd love to see that kind of research happen, especially if there's <laughs> such a dearth in, in the field of like, a huge yeah. gap of the kinds of things that are available. Yeah. My family, I would say in terms of my wife and I are more focused on let's as a society, I think we need more funding for linguistic anthropology first and mm. then uh, physical therapy second. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair. Fair. Huh. Um, is there anything related to the things that we've talked about that you'd like to dive in deeper to? Um, no, I guess I would just flip it around and reverse it and say what, uh, you know, you've got me here uh, mm -hmm. to talk about anything that interests you about human movement. Like what, and it doesn't have to be related to pain or rehab, it could be related to performance or just like different positions that you're interested in. Uh, like, how do you get there or, or what's stopping you? Like what, what questions do you have around human movement that I could shed light on? Hmm. Well, part of the interest is coming from, uh, my own history with my own knee and leg and mm -hmm. uh, been doing the ATG program that you talked about for that. Yeah. And that seems to be helping, but you know, it's kind of a slow process and mm -hmm. I, I, I get the sense I don't fully understand what's happening there with my knee and like uh, why the pain manifests the way that it does. Of yeah. Let's, I mean, if you're down with it, why don't we just dive into that specific thing? And I think one, you can benefit from it. And I think people can maybe see what the process is for what, what it's like when I do a uh, movement consult. So just first off, where does your knee hurt and mm -hmm. when, like, mm -hmm. what do you notice? Like, where does it hurt and when, and what, what's your explanation for it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, there's pain in different parts of the right leg. And mm -hmm. it started when I had I was diagnosed with Lyme disease like four years ago oh. and it attacked my right knee. And okay. that has basically my knee swelled up twice and okay. um, I got the Lyme disease treated, but there's been injuries still in the knee. And then uh -huh. that spread to the ankle and my hip because of, uh, I think overtraining running and then also overtraining yeah. seated meditation as well. So, ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I feel pain in the front of my knee on mm -hmm. sort of the left side and then yep. of like the patella and then I have plantar fasciitis and then the right side of my right ankle hurts sometimes and then the right side of my upper hip tends to hurt as well and okay and that's on the this is all on the right or just the all knees on the on right the leg okay it's all on the right yeah yeah yep. yeah um yeah so I mean it's it's if you think about meditation. So I'm actually sitting right now on a little cushion, mm -hmm. uh, right now, cross-legged. So mm -hmm. this is not like the world's best, uh, half Lotus or anything, but, mm -hmm. um, 
just thinking about this position is something you feel like you overtrained with mm -hmm. uh, uh, sitting meditation. So there is a lot of stress in terms of lengthening stress on the outside of mm -hmm. my right leg here. So um, if I am stiff in the medial thigh and the groin and my leg doesn't want to go down, there's resistance against it going down and I'm constantly, whether through gravity uh, or I'm actually even pushing down or whatever in this position, then the outside and the inside are going to be locked in something of a tug of war mediated by gravity pulling downward. So basically if we have dysfunction, as you said, anterior knee, maybe a little bit lateral at times, lateral ankle, lateral hip, anterior hip and stuff like that. And then did you mention any medial uh, foot pain as well? Plantar fasciitis, right? Yeah. Plantar fasciitis as well. Yeah. So just think about that entire leg from ankle to hip as being out of balance inside, outside and front to back. Mm. So the anterior knee pain is, is too much stiffness, not enough range of motion and flexion. So, you know, if you were to sit on your heels with your toes pointed, so I'll just show the uh, viewers what I'm talking about, this mm -hmm. kind of position, would that be doable for you? Or is that like, would probably be painful? I can do it. It's painful after a certain time and certainly not the most comfortable position for me. Yeah. So that's the opportunity right there in terms of range of motion, right? So mm. addressing the shin muscle. I don't have a video on the tibialis anterior smash, but it's pretty simple. You just take a foam roller and we're just doing it live here. And uh, you get some pressure onto that shin muscle, the anterior shin, breathe in, point the toe, contract, or rather I got that backwards. Breathe in, contract the muscle, I point the toe up and then breathe out, stretch it by pointing the toe. So you can do that with foam roller. You can do it with a bigger ball. You can do it with a lacrosse ball. You can do it with whatever tool you want. There's people make so many different mobility tools and you can spend a bunch of money, uh, trying different ones that you like, you can spend very little money and just try a couple, you know, there's even this kind of thing like this, this is called the stick, I think it's like a rolling pin and you can get in here and work on the shin muscle. Um, but, you know, increase your plantar flexion range of motion until it doesn't hurt at all in the shin when you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Get stronger by doing the tibialis raise, which is a, a, a video I have on my channel, Ben Patrick, uh, knees or toes guy, that, that's one I, ripped off straight from him increase your ankle flexibility by working on your calves smashing those with lacrosse balls foam rollers things like that and then get stronger through a full range of motion by doing the calf raises i have a video called better calf raises that shows straight leg and bent leg versions and again these are these are toes guy exercises that i just took looked at it developed a complete understanding of why i would have people do that and then i made my video explaining that check out mine check out his look at both of them, see what, see what works for you. If my explanation or his explanation makes more sense or works better, doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, that's an example of how to increase ankle flexibility and strength going both ways then. Okay. Let's talk inside, outside. So now we got to, if you're more flexible doing this to where you can tolerate more range of motion, then we also, you mentioned having some lateral knee pain and medial ankle pain. So the muscles that connect through, I'm oh, sorry, I'm just showing my table, this medial ankle here, they go behind this bone, which is the medial malleolus. If you're just listening it's typically to Typically on the other side of, uh, for what that's worth, I don't know if that matters. On the outside? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's still going to be the same approach, mm -hmm. but that's great to know. On the outside, the muscles that go through here are mm -hmm. called fibularis longus is the biggest one. And I have a video actually called fibularis longus smash where you just take a foam roller and get on the outside and push down and, and work on that muscle. That's a really important muscle in ankle sprains because when that ankle turns inward, the ligaments get affected. And then that muscle ends up in spasm almost always for people. And getting it out of spasm is an important part of rehab. Uh, and that's a muscle I do a lot of dry needling on for people who have had ankle sprains in my uh, clinical practice. But, you know, working on soft tissue work, flexibility and tissue loading for the medial ankle muscles that are behind the shin in here, because even if the pain is on the outside, this is going to be stiff because there's a tug of war. Mm -hmm. So working in here, um, and I don't have a video yet on that one. You're giving me some impetus to shoot one here. We're working on the outside and then work on stand on one foot and re 
build your body's balance to be able to hold because it'll be wobbly at first. If you stand on your right foot versus standing on your left foot, the one where you have pain and dysfunction is going to be wobblier. I mm -hmm. guarantee it mm -hmm. with your eyes closed, especially because your proprioception will be affected when you have pain. Proprioception is the brain's sense of where joints are in space without vision. Um, so that's just the ankle. And then just take the exact same approach at the knee. So we mm -hmm. deal with the stiffness and you mentioned the, the rectus femoris foam rolling video. I think you got a lot of mileage out of that. Probably also that's a real, uh, low hanging fruit for you is working on tissue stiffness mm -hmm. in the quadriceps, especially rectus femoris. And then the lateral quad passes lateralis, cause that's going to be above the lateral knee, kind of this whole lateral seam being over tensioned due to excessive sitting. So we got to work on the outside. We also got to work on the inside. So adductor smash is a video I have about how to work on the muscles of the groin. In super lunge is the stretch I have where you stretch that muscle out doing exercise. There's, I need to record a video of this, but there's an exercise called Cossack squats that are great for developing strength and flexibility in the medial thigh. Um, the clamshell is an exercise I have for uh, medial glute strengthening, but developing strength, range of motion and balance between these opposing forces inside and outside and front to back through ankle, hip and knee is you know, maybe that doesn't completely eradicate all of your pain, mm -hmm. but it's very likely that you have some just low hanging fruit in terms of some dysfunction, in terms of tissue stiffness, range of motion, strength through that range of motion and stability in anywhere on that chain and attacking any of it will probably help. But really the process is going to be for you going through all of that stuff I just talked about exploring, finding like you might go into your groin and your adductors and you've not explored there before and take this kind of ball and smash in there. And you, you know, you might see God when <laughs> you put pressure on your groin muscle or that might happen somewhere else along the chain. And you'd be like, okay, that's where I need to focus on dealing with that stiffness, reducing that. And then again, building up uh, the range of motion and the resilience uh, to be able to tolerate more movement. So does that make sense? Definitely. Yeah. It give me a lot to work with and I, I hope you make those videos. Um, yeah, I uh, will. I will. But that's an idea of like, obviously, you know, we just talked pretty quickly about your mm -hmm. knee pain, but you have a lot of homework mm -hmm. to go home and work on now. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I kind of like the mm -hmm. consultation as yeah. an introduction to my service. Cause I can just tell you, here's a whole bunch of stuff that'll probably work, but really without me putting my hands on you and doing the full physical therapy exam, I can't tell exactly what it is. I could mimic it from home, mm -hmm. but the truth is you probably need work on all the stuff I just said anyway, mm -hmm. and going through it will go, you'll go through the process of exploring all these different tissues, bringing awareness to all these different tissues and finding where the most dysfunctional areas are. So you know where to work for the mm -hmm. most bang for your buck. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to try all of that stuff. And, um, it's a good supplement to the ATG program because I think there's like different things you pointed out there. Um, mm -hmm. One last question I'd be curious to ask is Please. like, um, yeah, I've noticed, I, I'm curious in general about like yeah. why the pain happens when it happens and for what reason, yeah. because like the hip pain I notice happens if I walk a lot, like that will exacerbate it. But, but the knee, yeah. I can't, I can't tell any rhyme or reason of like why it hurts one day and doesn't hurt another day. And mm -hmm. I'm like generally curious about that kind of thing of like, cause it's not, isn't none of these pains that I pointed out are like consistent and they're different on different days. Yeah. The, the best thing for that, I think is, um, keeping sort of a journal and mm. just, just noting activities. Uh, and it might take a little bit because, I could throw out a bunch of possibilities and mm -hmm. the, your hip, your anterior hip hurts when you walk makes sense because walking is repeated hip extension. So mm -hmm. if you have tissue stiffness there and you're unable to get into that extension, you're constantly pulling against the tight tissue that can aggravate things. The other stuff, I think it's, uh, you'll just have to bring your awareness to it. And that might involve journaling just so that you can keep track of patterns and recognize patterns, but also just really when you have pain, like, okay. I'm having pain. That is a data point. And like, what can I look at in the last day? What did, what did I notice beforehand? Did I notice any muscles feeling tight or stiff? Did I notice uh, any change in activity? Did I notice any position, sleeping position, sitting position, anything like that. So you're going to have to become a little bit of a detective with that stuff in terms of finding inciting activities. The other thing 
is just to try uh, a lot of different lower body exercises that take you through a full range of motion. Things mm. like single leg squats, lunges, uh, double leg squats, um, you know, Cossack squats, whatever, deadlifts, deep hinges, getting into all the extremes of range of motion, finding where you're limited and which of those just feel less comfortable. Maybe something just bang brings on your pain. And that's the, the nugget of gold you're looking for because mm. fundamentally when I do a physical therapy exam, I'm going to do a bunch of standardized tests and measures and range of motion and strength. And I'm going to screen if it's a lower body thing, I'm going to screen out the lumbar spine and make sure that's not involved. If it's an upper body thing, I'm going to screen the neck and make sure that's not involved. There's a lot of places to look, but what I'm looking for more than anything is I want something that I can do, whether it's a movement, a test of pressure, whatever that recreates that person's pain. That's what I'm always asking when I'm doing a physical therapy exam. Is that your pain? Mm -hmm. You know, not like, is it, does it hurt? That's information too. And that's very valuable, but the, the nugget of gold, the key to cracking the case is always, is it your pain? If I can recreate your pain, then we know what we know, at least a movement or a position that causes it. And we can try to do things, test that retest it, come back. All our interventions should reduce the pain is mm -hmm. basically the approach. Mm -hmm. And probably doing the, the suite of stuff that you talked about will, will help whatever the cause is and. Uh, yeah. And it'll also bring awareness. You may find, you may find the pain by doing mm -hmm. the detective work of working on your hip, knee and ankle, 360 degrees, you know, back front, side to side, you'll find dysfunction and painful positions in all likelihood. And you'll learn more about mm -hmm. what you think causes it. And you may notice that doing certain types of exercises or stretches or soft tissue work or whatever makes it better. And some things may even make it worse. And that, that is also information. So mm -hmm. everything is just, you know, you're updating your mental picture of the, the diagnosis and, you know, or if I'm the clinician, I'm updating my mental picture, but since you in this world where I'm just kind of giving, I'm just sort of showing you a general approach, you are the clinician. So you have to um, do the detective work and, and look through and find that stuff on your own. Terrific. Terrific. Sam, I, okay. I think it's really helpful to me personally to walk through this and hopefully it's a good yeah. demonstration for anyone watching or listening as well. Um, Absolutely. And anything else you want to say before we head out? No, I just want to say thank you for having me on, Tasha. And this was a great conversation. I really enjoyed spending a little time with you. Uh, I would love to uh, maybe do it again in the future after uh, we uh, have some more time to, to, to keep, keep trucking and make some more stuff. And then I just want to tell anybody who's listening, check out movebetterproject.com. That's my website. You can book a session with me there on the Move Better Project on YouTube. My Twitter handle is movebetterproj. Uh, P-R-O-G-A at the end. And uh, yeah, follow me, check me out, send me a tweet, comment on a YouTube video, whatever. You can send me an email, sam at movebetterproject.com. Um, and yeah, thanks to everybody who's listening. Thanks to you for having me on again. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for coming on, Sam.